chapter sixteen of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter sixteen miss hunt's missionary lover one afternoon betty sat in her favorite corner of the little public library she could see far down the long rambling street and when she lifted her eyes from the magazine they were rested by the tall trees and the dignified homes that lined the roadway betty now studied the magazines conscientiously she no longer skipped descriptions nor read for amusement time and again she had been disappointed in her literary efforts but recently there had been a delightful break in the habits of her obdurate editors she had received ten dollars as a prize given for the picture of the most artistic and appropriate bedroom for a young girl and shortly afterwards two dollars and a half for a picture and description of the handsome antique writing-desk lois had given her her old enthusiasm was fired and day by day betty studied and wrote for the papers and journals as dr baird subscribed only for the more literary ones betty went to the library to read the popular periodicals miss hunt was in her place behind the desk no one else was in the room the graceful librarian in her customary lawn for the autumn was unusually warm with its indefinite pink flowers her fast whitening hair lying softly on her forehead in natural waves her face bright and flushed from the animated conversation she and betty had carried on about home missions and literature was smiling to herself as she pasted labels on a pile of new books betty was reading an article on pumpkin color as a background for mahogany in the domicile when two pretty girls about her own age came in laughing and whispering and handed their books to miss hunt the librarian looked from the two faces bending over the books on her desk to where betty sat reading there is a young lady over there who is new to our village she said to them nodding slightly towards betty the daughter of dr baird a presbyterian minister she came home from school in june the two heads were turned somewhat indifferently towards the window where betty was half hidden by a pillar why it's that awfully chic girl we saw yesterday in a pony cart with another girl who was stunningly dressed said one edith banks a slender maiden of eighteen whose light fluffy hair had a tendency to flow gracefully over an oval face with the complexion of a may blossom her companion was of medium height her eyes of a limpid brown her hair parted in the middle adding to the classic effect of her regular features there was however as much attention to the prevailing styles in her severe tailor-made suit as in the airy gown of her friend her name was gertrude lynn gertrude had an overweening respect for style or good form in appearance and the nameless little things that make up the index of a certain small and often very unimportant division of society she did not desire to know any one who did not have some claim to the best society consequently she hesitated when kindly miss hunt said she would like to introduce them to the new girl quickly she summed up betty's credentials in dress and appearance for entrance to the sacred coterie of her little village edith with a democratic spirit that comes from attending a large college had given no thought to betty's social qualifications she wondered whether she had time for another acquaintance but good-hearted and genuine as she was and with a healthy girl's love for friends she at once accepted miss hunt's invitation betty wholly unconscious of their scrutiny and that her social fate hung in the balance was startled by their approach and glanced up with her eyes full of surprise and her cheeks colored prettily when she heard miss hunt giving the names of two unknown girls coming out of her book world betty extended a friendly hand to them while miss hunt withdrew to look after the wants of a visitor you have not lived here long asked edith sitting down on the bench next to betty while gertrude sank on a chair and arranged her gown in classic folds i came here in june after graduating from the pines answered betty the pines repeated gertrude did you ever hear of a miss livingstone there do you mean mary livingstone asked betty tossing her magazine on the table and bending forward eagerly yes mary she has married 
she married dorothy king's brother she and mr king are now living near here and you know them i know mrs king slightly why mary was one of my very best friends at the pines she was a senior my first year but she was awfully good to me dorothy was in my class how interesting exclaimed edith i too know the livingstones it proves how small the world is she laughed as she uttered the hackneyed comment and it proves how interesting the world is cried betty joyfully i am so glad to meet friends of mary we are not old friends though we know each other pretty well explained gertrude if you know mary at all i feel that i know you said betty and she smiled so happily into gertrude's eyes that the formal girl forgot her conventionality and pressed warmly the hand that betty gave each one in recognition of the common friend i must let this handshake be a farewell for a few days for i am going away said edith standing up i must hurry home and pack my trunk may i come to see you as soon as i get back do come i want you to meet my friend miss bird who is with me then we can make plans to call on mrs king said gertrude with many last whisperings the girls left the library and betty her heart fluttering pleasantly went back to her pumpkin background miss hunt was still pasting labels and smiling over betty's meeting the girls for she entered into everyone's pleasures with a lively interest and the three attractive girls talking at once had warmed her heart the room was quiet again save for the ticking of the low french clock on the mantelpiece and the rustle of the leaves of betty's magazine betty turned when she heard a firm steady tread on the granite steps leading up to the library the door opened and she saw a tall clerical-looking gentleman who wiped his forehead she decided in a truly oratorical way yes she thought he preaches or lectures his long cuffs alone would betray him the librarian examining the books and sorting the labels did not notice him until a deep voice said miss hunt i believe oh trembled from the librarian's lips when she looked up and met the stranger's eyes betty saw her hand shake as she put down a book and leaned back in her chair you john was all she said but betty turned her head away so appealing were voice and look betty could not leave the room without disturbing them she was too far away to hear their conversation but her imagination worked rapidly he was an old lover a missionary and that accounted for miss hunt's avidity for missions they had been parted by a lover's quarrel and at last were reunited betty longed to bless them to beg them to marry without delay for fear something might come between them again she had only a vague idea about lovers quarrels but that represented them in quite another and far more enthralling aspect than ordinary quarrels a lovers quarrel a term full of the richest possibilities of sad sweetness heartbreak faded flowers all the delicate appurtenances of romance beloved romance of her lochinvar her saint agnes eve how terrible it would be if one of those mysterious yet pathetically beautiful quarrels should take place and no one intervene with misty memories of bookish lovers quarrels like the one in all she hath she felt they were usually intangible light as air yet heavy as rain with tears once she heard the lover turn away abruptly betty grew cold had a new quarrel begun the lover usually turned on his heel while the heroine sank gracefully into her chair poor miss hunt had only a revolving chair that had an underhand way of tilting back unexpectedly betty half arose and looked towards the water cooler but no thank goodness he had returned and miss hunt looked quite rosy betty sat down and again gazed out of the window she kept her back towards them and looked out fixedly until she saw someone coming towards the library she could not have them disturbed by people too dull and sordid to know that a true romance was being enacted under their very eyes who would ask for a tame book of fiction and keep the lovers apart oh it was that horrid miss smath the village gossip and she had a book under her arm 
betty jumped up coughing warningly and with downcast eyes walked towards the old new lovers miss hunt looked at her vaguely and the middle-aged lover stepped back and feigned an interest in the rows of juvenile books i'll take your place miss hunt if you if you want began betty impulsively almost in a whisper but she did not know how to go on how could she say if you want to escape mrs smath with your returned lover miss hunt blushed then smiled and nodded appreciatively recovering any possible loss of poise before the noted gossip entered i understand she had time to whisper and she opened her big book to note the return of the gossip's volume betty stood by furtively taking in the stranger's appearance and then as furtively stealing a glance at miss hunt's happy face mrs smath left after a futile effort to draw miss hunt out about the man who stood looking at the long row of books for children as though fascinated the interruption gave betty a good opportunity to go but as she was hurrying to the door miss hunt motioned her to stay she was glad to find that it was nearly closing time no lover's quarrel yet she sighed with relief when she saw miss hunt close her record book and put it away taking hold of betty's hand miss hunt led her up to the middle-aged lover and introduced her to him miss baird the clergyman repeated i came from the west to consult dr baird about my work and and smiling first down at the lady by his side then across to the tall girl he added i came to consult miss hunt about another matter also very very near my heart his smile was so genial and his glance so open and kind that betty fell in love with the middle-aged lover herself and felt very happy that her dear miss hunt had recovered him shall i keep the library for you tonight? asked betty miss hunt hesitated if you would be so kind answered the lover laughing i am going to take matters into my own hands this time in a day or two betty received this note from miss hunt my dear miss baird i have spoken to several of the members of the library committee about your fitness for the position of librarian they seemed pleased with the idea i have not however seen mr webby the president who is now out of town of course they look upon you as a substitute for the present but i hope to convince them that you are prepared in every way to hold this responsible place it would be a great pleasure to me to think of you in the beautiful library i have grown to love when i am in the far west happier and happier as the days go by with best wishes for your success i am yours most sincerely harriet hunt End of chapter 16. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 17 of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 17. The New Librarian and Her President Betty sat behind the desk at the library, waiting for a trustee's meeting she was in miss hunt's revolving chair she told lois that the fact that her chair revolved made all the difference in the world in her attitude the revolutions emphasized the practical business side of the new venture otherwise she might think she was holding an afternoon tea with books in the place of the conventional teacups when she wheeled around in that chair she felt years older and had an inrush of true business-like spirit a revolving chair was incompatible with sentiment or romance or even original thoughts and she sometimes wondered how miss hunt's romance had managed to come off so beautifully successful as the library was not opened until ten o'clock betty still marketed for her mother and took her father to the station the enterprise did not interfere with any necessary home duty and at the end of the year she expected to have three hundred and sixty dollars to pay on the mortgage a mere sop perhaps for that terrible cerberus nevertheless something this first meeting with her trustees for betty always with great glee used the possessive pronoun was a big event and she looked forward to it with pride and a very natural self-distrust 
the president of the library association was accounted the richest man in the community and for that reason had been elected to the office his name had been familiar to betty but she had not known him even by sight on this momentous evening betty was very dainty in her white flannel suit with a red rose in her hair she had piled her hair on the top of her head with a view to looking mature the one wish of her heart was to look ten years older the coquettish rose however frustrated all her careful efforts to appear old enough and wise enough to be the custodian of the library the president mr webby came first betty knew him by inspiration he looked at her with the indulgent smile of one who had seen children masquerading before in their elders clothes his piercing black eyes set close together never smiled he smiled only with the muscles of his cheeks he was short and wiry and clothed in handsome well-padded homespun betty was at least two inches taller than he and felt that she could not really be afraid of a man on whose bald spot she could look down i was not here when the trustees elected a temporary librarian is she in the committee room he asked briskly looking around for the temporary person necessarily temporary since he had not been present when she was elected that temporary made betty quite faint and she sank back into her revolving chair perhaps for the first time in her short life she was incapable of uttering a word mr webby glanced at her sharply then as if as was his habit denying the two-edgedness of his unloving eyes he moved his facial muscles into a propitiating smile can you direct me to miss baird and betty ashamed of her youth ashamed of her lack of a business air ashamed of every earthly advantage she possessed for mr webby had this not uncommon power of putting people to disadvantage stood up instinctively and answered i am miss baird you that was all he said and though the smiling muscles worked mechanically betty could foresee this president rising from his chair in the committee meeting and saying her youth is against her we must have a woman of experience at the head of our library of which i am the president meanwhile he was saying something to her that was evidently meant to be agreeable but those other words were ringing in her ears and she could only make out that he was glad to meet her and above all he was surprised at her youth and that youth was to be envied betty's trustees came in one by one and greeting her pleasantly filed into the little committee room she was not asked to attend the meeting perhaps they thought it was unwise to leave the reading-room unprotected at least so she tried to comfort herself but with her remembrance of the temporary librarian and that you of surprise and disapproval betty saw her three hundred and sixty dollars divided by twelve and she could be sure of only thirty she pressed her lips together and tried to smile as she thought anyway it will pay for father's overcoat and for hope dies lingeringly in the young perhaps they would not be able to find a librarian for a month or two and then she would have enough to pay the pawnbroker after a short conference the trustees came out all were hovering around the president as if his laconic sentences held golden thoughts they smiled good-night to betty but half humorously apparently they had gained a new point of view they made her feel very young sadly young craig ellsworth came with lois to take betty home they found her with flushed cheeks and unnaturally bright eyes she revolved and revolved in her chair until lois cried out that she made her dizzy without answering lois she stopped and began putting away the records and piling in a neater row the books that had been returned why don't you say something craig asked standing in front of the desk that betty was so proud of betty looked up in surprise pardon me craig i was thinking about something when betty thinks craig said lois laughing teasingly she simply has to give herself up to it she has had such a little bit of experience yes that's true answered betty absently going into another room for her hat and coat what's up craig asked in a whisper i never saw betty this way before 
lois shook her head whispering back i am afraid something is wrong about this position betty came in fastening her hat pins in her hat and craig helped her on with her coat dear betty please tell us what has happened asked lois putting her arms around her i can't talk it will do you good to blow out cried craig encouragingly i think it is all up here she said with an effort oh betty don't say that don't cried lois dropping into a chair and mechanically betty followed her example it's my age my lack of age said betty bitterly i can't see what difference it makes when i can do the work then she told them everything that had passed during the evening perhaps it's not so bad as you think consoled lois but down in her heart she feared the worst never had betty looked so young and the rose in her hair added to the effect of a brilliant beautiful child hardly one to whom a hard-headed business man would think of entrusting the buying of books and the handling of a fairly large sum of money and from whom he could expect the judgment and tact needed in a place where everything fell on one pair of shoulders that pretty golden-haired head would not naturally impress a casual observer as an old one on young shoulders where did you get that rose asked lois apparently irrelevantly but to her that rose had made a difference in betty's fate a little child gave it to me and to please her i stuck it into my hair answered betty as though she barely heard wearily she got up and craig silently helped her put the chairs in place and turn off the electric lights lois wandered restlessly to and fro the cart held three grave passengers merrylegs in the moonlight trotted jubilantly towards home arching his pretty neck and kicking his white feet but all to no account his friends were blind to his beauty and cleverness there is no use in speaking to mother about it just now betty said when they entered the house mrs baird met her daughter at the door and kissed her tenderly believing her silence to be due to weariness and hurried her off to bed end of chapter seventeen recording by holly jensen Chapter 18 of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 18 Shockingly Young. Lois, Lois, come in here, Betty called across the narrow hall the next morning after an almost sleepless night. Lois hurried over with one hand full of hairpins and the other grasping a hairbrush see how perfectly ashen i look said betty sitting down on the bed despairingly it will trouble father all day if he sees me this way he worries more than he did in weston what shall i do pinch your cheeks betty suggested lois turning her face to the light yes you are ghastly white you dear thing i wish you wouldn't worry over losing that hateful library position it meant so much lois and it was such a good way to help father he shows the strain of his work and the anxiety about our debts if you would only take some of our money cried lois for the hundredth time the two friends had grown so like sisters that they had no secrets from each other though betty's mother would have considered it the very worst taste to speak of private money matters to any one else of course we couldn't possibly do it the bairds are too independent for that answered betty we always come out right in the end now i must try to get more color into my face and she jumped off the bed and stood by the glass rubbing her cheeks until they were crimson edwina awakened by the conversation which they had failed to keep to a whisper sat up in bed and watched the girls for a time what are you doing cousin betty what makes you pinch your cheeks she said finally oh to be more beautiful of course answered betty turning round and throwing edwina a kiss that's good cried lois clapping her hands now you look like yourself with that lovely color however in a few minutes the unnatural flush died away and betty looked despondently at her reflection 
it's a regular lancastrian and york battle said lois to whom the color deepening on betty's cheeks then disappearing suggested the idea of red and white roses edwyna had remained silent but her interest in the operation never flagged she was gradually realizing that betty wanted to look red as she put it why don't you put on a little rogue cousin betty she asked mrs siggins always put a little red rogue on her face when she went to a party betty and lois looked at each other inquiringly what did the child mean edwyna plainly showed her disgust at their dullness a little red rogue a little red rogue she insisted impatiently then it dawned on betty and in a moment she had her manicure ointment in her hand and was putting it on her cheeks rouge lois rouge three cheers for edwyna's a little red rogue here's the very chap i want she dabbed a big red splotch on either cheek much to edwyna's delight betty betty cried lois throwing herself into a rocking chair and laughing until she almost cried edwyna joined in feeling that somehow she was the cause of it what will you do next cried lois i consider this a stroke of genius edwyna's and mine combined answered betty deep in the new art of painting father is so guileless he will never suspect and mother is always so busy seeing him off that i can hide it from her oh joy look betty turned a very pink cheek towards the light for inspection lois sprang to her side and examined it critically you have put too much on it's an inch thick let me rub it off she snatched a towel oh but i want to look perfectly blooming lois protested betty backing away this high color is very becoming she began to perfect her art with a few more gentle touches just then a ray of sunshine striking her face made her drop her hand and give a little scream how dreadful it streaked lois told you so piped edwyna who had a strong sense of justice and very little sympathy with temperamental or artistic peculiarities betty and lois laughed betty pretending to do all sorts of things to avenge herself on edwyna for taking lois's part sit in the window here where the light is good commanded lois forcing her into a chair and i'll smooth it until it is in reality a lancastrian rose lois you grow poetical chaffed betty holding herself as prim and straight as a wooden figure fountains of hope were bubbling up in her heart again maybe it was only her imagination that had made it all seem so ominous last night anyway she would keep it from her parents as long as she could lois finished her little pattings and soft manipulations then stood off with her head to one side and inspected the cheeks i believe it would deceive anyone early in the morning before the sun is very high she announced of course you'll put on a veil when you take your father to the station yes and i'll keep it down as much as i can poor old daddy sighed betty hope growing less effervescent when she thought of him now to dress edwyna here let me button your dress there now for the hair ribbon betty opened a box filled with different colored ribbons and selected one of bright red i have a passion for hair ribbons said edwyna with content fingering the box full in less than half an hour they were all in the dining room you're looking unusually well this morning elizabeth said dr baird when he kissed her good morning your librarianship agrees with you i am glad you are well situated it is an education to live with books to have their constant companionship betty turned quickly from her unsuspicious father to the breakfast table and busied herself there a moment then excused herself to go upstairs she had only a minute to spare but she threw herself on her knees at the side of the bed and buried her face in her arms it was an incoherent little prayer but quieted betty rose and hurried downstairs oh betty whispered lois you have rubbed the pink off your face and some of it is on your shirtwaist sleeve betty gasped fortunately there was only a slight stain on the white sleeve but her face had returned to its former paleness 
she pulled down her veil and with a hasty kiss for her mother went out of the door laughing and waving her hand as if the lightest heart on long island beat under the white shirtwaist with its tell-tale spot of pink betty is in high spirits this morning said mrs baird to lois as they watched the cart drive off she is happy now that she has her work it is congenial and there is no doubt that it will help out wonderfully mrs baird smiled contentedly poor lois mumbled a reply and with some excuse about airing the rooms sped away in the library betty was going over the fall list of books when she heard footsteps outside the door they hesitated and seemed reluctant to go any farther looking up from her heap of many-colored catalogues she saw mr cloud and two other trustees entering mr cloud had always had a pleasant word for betty a kind well how do you like it by this time and in her loyal heart she had refused to see anything humorous in the reiterated formula though lois said if she had the place she would throw it up to escape that inevitable question and the stereotyped smile of benevolence accompanying it this morning as mr cloud approached the desk the first of the familiar words escaped well how do you like but he smothered them halfway out and grew very red in the face then mumbling a faint good morning he wandered aimlessly about the room examining books of travel biography juveniles all the while shunning betty though he glanced at her out of the corners of his small blue eyes when she was apparently absorbed in her work several times he coughed the other trustees after speaking diffidently to betty stood at a window talking in an undertone are you taking anything for your cough mr cloud asked betty with solicitude as he hacked ostentatiously she had often heard miss hunt open a conversation with embarrassed people that way and had seen brilliant results betty longed to talk with mr cloud and gain his influence to help her keep her position only s b s i find them excellent for any tickling of the throat he answered solemnly walking over to the desk and sitting down opposite betty and motioning the other trustees to take chairs near him it is best not to let a cold run on said betty sagely and feeling much like miss hunt as she placed chairs for the men who sat on the edge as if they were ready to fly at a moment's notice yes this time of the year they are apt to hang on all winter mr cloud replied still mournfully his mind was evidently on another subject and even the joys of a talk devoted exclusively to his own ailments could not cheer him nor divert him from what weighed on his mind he coughed again then rubbing his hands in a sort of apologetic fashion he said the trustees had a meeting last night cough cough the other two men stirred in their chairs and the younger one cleared his throat yes i remember seeing you there also the president mr webby for the first time cough much coughing yes i was there he admitted taking out an s b cough drop mr webby is looking well after his european trip said one of the other trustees mr cloud and his companion looked at him but received his remark in silence mr webby was surprised to find that i was so young wasn't he betty asked determined to end the suspense for by this time she was compelled to believe that mr cloud's embarrassment came from the fear of telling her the unpleasant news that they were soon to dispense with her services yes he was said mr cloud brightening at the opening while the other trustees leaned back in their chairs as if their minds were suddenly open to the reason why chairs had backs in fact mr webby was not only surprised but miss baird he was shocked yes positively shocked to find you so young now really mr cloud i never heard before that it was shocking to be young answered betty with spirit it's inconvenient at times but certainly not shocking besides this is the day of young people in all the affairs of life betty felt that she was making a creditable defence but mr cloud's mind was dwelling on mr webby and he was deaf to her words the town owes a great deal to mr webby a great deal yes i regret to say he was shocked i might say painfully shocked 
had he recovered before you left him asked betty pertly for she felt perfectly safe in her irony with these obtuse men he kept repeating all the way to the car for he went home in the car he doesn't take his fine horses out at night often he kept repeating down to the corner of high street i should say for i didn't go down as far as the car he kept repeating how shocked he was to find you so young so very young i am sure he must have kept repeating it all the way home though as i said i only went as far as the high street corner the corner you know that meets main street after you left mr webby he walked up to prospect street and took the car there interposed one of the other trustees mr cloud was showing his surprise and interest in the strange phenomenon but before he had time to put it into words betty said gravely it's a pity you didn't go all the way home with him perhaps you might have helped him in his sad mental plight yes he was shocked he acknowledged that as a substitute your being so young did not make any particular difference he is our richest man the village couldn't do without him well what has he done for the village asked betty he has the largest house here the very largest answered mr cloud with the greatest respect does he buy largely from your merchants oh no no he has everything sent from the city he can afford to even his coal is from his own mines does he contribute to public improvements pursued betty with a rather sarcastic smile well you know there is not much that can be done in a place of this size his property is outside the village limits so his taxes are low he's a shrewd business man very shrewd then i can't see what the village has to be thankful for so far as he is concerned said betty emphatically why he's an honor to the village even in new york his name is well known it's good for a place to have such men suddenly he collapsed and took another cough drop betty watched him waiting for the blow she knew was in store for her but she saw that she would be compelled to prod him to get at the bottom of what took place at the meeting the other two trustees were equally unpromising material well what did mr webby tell you to do about me she asked now that is just what we came in to see you about he said swallowing the cough drop whole yes that is what we came in to see you about echoed the others i was delegated to tell you that in a month or two your services would not be needed why do you wait a month or two asked betty her heart galloping now that is the remarkable part mr webby has a cousin who is fitted in every way to fill this position but she won't be able to take the place until ah i see a relative did he give you her age i think you ought to have a certificate that she is not under fifty we can trust mr webby he has a long head he made his own fortune the two trustees nodded in admiring concurrence yes but i don't think he will make anyone else's fortune said betty she was wearied with hearing of mr webby and turned abruptly away she saw no reason why she should listen to the eulogies of a man who worth millions should out of self-interest take her little mite and give it to a relative mr cloud and the other two trustees stood up awkwardly and saying good-bye made a hasty and no doubt relieved exit betty sat long gazing at the blue publisher's list on the desk her eyes ceased to see the pleasant legends and hot tears washed away from her cheeks every trace of the little red rogue end of chapter eighteen recording by holly jensen chapter nineteen of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter nineteen in the tea room an hour after the trustees committee had discharged its duty edith banks swept breezily into the library she had been calling on mrs webby who told her the news about betty and it had sent her flying down hardly a day had passed since their first meeting that had not seen edith in the library for she and betty had become warm friends 
indeed betty lois edith and gertrude were constantly together when betty had a free hour and when she was engaged they dropped in to see her though so completely was betty wrapped up in her new work that they complained that she was barely civil to them betty sternly quoted duty before pleasure and went on cataloguing the books though it was very evident as they retorted that she found her pleasure in her duty she had been studying the different methods of classification and record and hoped to introduce a more modern and expeditious plan than was at present in operation of this she said nothing as it would seem to reflect on miss hunt but her eager and conscientious mind could not stand still in any enterprise where there was an ideal to be reached Today, mrs webby's words were ringing in edith's ears no i have not met miss baird she had said of course with our many social duties i could not call the bairds are new people i never call on new people i have heard though that she is very nice it's unfortunate that she's so young fancy a girl of seventeen holding such a position mr webby i assure you was very much provoked last night when he learned how young she was i don't know what would become of that library if mr webby was not interested in it oh very likely miss baird's friend mrs king would see that the place was kept going she is perfectly devoted to miss baird edith assured her mrs king you surprise me are mrs king and miss baird friends very intimate friends i am sure mr webby did not know that he admires mr king extremely they have met on the golf links frequently i have never met mrs king i thought of calling but they say she does not care to meet the people here the kings are new people suggested edith maliciously she saw that mrs webby was chagrined that they had made a social blunder at a time when they were laboring to entrench themselves in society a society of which mary livingstone king was easily the leader edith wished someone was there to appreciate the neatness the completeness with which she was avenging betty yes miss baird is their most intimate friend and of mr king's sister too they went to school together she emphasized is it possible exclaimed mrs webby growing red and her scotch-irish brogue betraying itself yes and mrs brooks thinks she is the loveliest girl she knows pursued edith relentlessly enjoying mrs webby's discomfiture mrs jackson brooks the words actually sputtered from her wide mouth yes mrs jackson brooks repeated edith crushingly and dr mason who is perhaps our most learned man says miss baird is the best librarian we have ever had in this manner the conversation had gone on edith working unsparingly on mrs webby's sensitive point social success they deserve it the snobs for treating betty that way in order to get in a poor relative she said to herself and then left the unhappy woman to hurry to betty and learn if she knew her fate and to comfort her as soon as she saw betty she thought she knows it with a great bustle and air of stirring things up she said it is time for luncheon mistress betty baird is it said betty listlessly looking at the clock i don't feel like eating i have lost my appetite i suppose i have had too much mental pabulum she smiled but under it edith detected a weariness quite foreign to betty's usually spontaneous gaiety mrs brooks is to be at the tea-room at one o'clock and she wishes to see you jack's chum dunny is here they want us to go out friday night to see mrs king and we are to make plans in the tea-room how kind friday night i can go for that is one of the evenings the library is closed i'll put on my hat and run down with you over her white flannel dress she threw a long blue coat punched the hat pins through the white felt college hat and then locking the door put the key into her pocket she took a deep breath as she stepped out into the delightful autumn air a bright coal fire burned in the grate of the tea-room betty who had been shaking with nervous chills since the trustees left her was glad to see the cheerful light 
and dragged up a low chair and throwing off her coat sat toasting her feet until the door flew open and jack brooks with a pompous show of gallantry bowed his mother in enter madame he said waving his hands then slamming the door in the face of his chum who was close behind oh jack remonstrated his horrified mother i have faith in little dunny's ability to open a door you see it was not misplaced he added as dunny lane came grinning in lane was a tall ruggedly built boy of nineteen or twenty with a kind open face and thick hair that looked as if a bottle of peroxide of hydrogen had been carelessly spilt over it he was followed by jack's dog a poor mongrel thing that he had picked up somewhere and which followed him about with permanently beseeching eyes dunny took the little creature up under his arm and bowed to the girls when mrs brooks gave their names blushing to a rich mahogany color through the tan his eyes were merry and every one liked him even if he could only say in his deep voice awfully glad to know you and give an aching handshake then remain silent during the remainder of the conversation one felt his good will and health when his strong white teeth gleamed from his big open mouth as he laughed heartily at every one's cleverness and even attempts at cleverness did not weary dunny find a chair for mr lane said mrs brooks reproachfully mother mother you nag so laughed jack you expect us to be as polite as french dancing masters dunny smiled embarrassedly on finding himself the topic of conversation before two strange young ladies and mrs brooks dunny will take to the tall timbers in a minute said jack easily mrs brooks made dunny sit by her on the sofa endeavoring to atone for her happy-go-lucky son's manners betty had remained standing until mrs brooks sat down then she turned again to the fire unheeding the pleasantries that were passing from one to another her mind slipped back to the bitter disappointment of the morning and while jack and edith were talking and mrs brooks was trying to make dunny forget his embarrassment she went over the painful scene of the morning again and again jack sauntered over to betty keeping up a running fire of conversation with edith and an occasional joke with dunny a penny for your thoughts miss baird he said tossing a bright penny down on the table by her side and sinking lazily into a chair betty looked up with a start they are not worth a bright new penny they are dull and tiresome i'll run the risk gladly he said laughing leaning towards the fire and warming his hands while he gave her a penetrating glance betty shook her head i always play fair here is your tea chappie interrupted dunny thrusting a cup at jack and inclining his head towards betty's back to indicate that it was for her betty turned round won't you accept his tea miss baird jack said imploringly with hands clasped in supplication then turning to dunny look here old fellow you must not gorge on this tea you are in training you know dunny grinned that's all right if it's weak he replied we are allowed to drink weak tea say dunny did you ever buck up against anything like this tea for strength asked jack banteringly taking a sip and hurriedly putting down the cup in disgust dunny grinned yes tom santee jack roared by jove that's one for you dunny tom is the yale halfback he explained to betty still chuckling over dunny's joke the door opened and gertrude rustled in so glad to see you mrs brooks delighted to see you out after your attack of grip why here is mr lane when did you come to our village without waiting for replies gertrude rattled on in her high key tossing off her fluffy neck scarf and posing gracefully by the mantel why betty what makes you so quiet i almost overlooked you she said then flew over to mrs brooks and began a steady flow of talk before betty could answer dunny wandered over to edith and jack leaned closer to betty what's up betty won't you tell a fellow he asked i'll whisper it for i don't want everyone to know just yet betty drew closer until their heads almost touched i'm going to lose my job she said and tried to laugh it off jack put out a protecting hand 
i'll tell mother and she will see that you get it back she can manage old webby no don't you do that answered betty emphatically it is settled and i would not stay if they are not satisfied there must be something else for me i am going to find it too betty lifted her head with that characteristic movement that all her friends had learned meant no failure it's tough luck anyhow after the way you have tried everything consoled jack for betty had confided in him it would have been difficult for betty to tell which boy had been of the greater help to her jack or craig ellsworth jack was two years older than craig but the latter had a sternness and dignity that fun-loving easy-going jack lacked and betty felt that he could understand the situation better than rich jack brooks for craig too had to make a place for himself those trustees are a bunch of fools said jack relieving his feelings in vituperation impeccable webby joined in betty do you know jack mr webby is one of those horrid people who see at once the very thing you are trying to hide if you have on an old pair of shoes you can curl up your feet all you please but he sees them if you have a rip in your glove you can feel his gimlet eyes going right through it even if you do clench your hands until they ache you just can't escape him the moment his eyes rested on me he saw my seventeen years two months and fourteen days you don't look so terribly young to me said jack eyeing betty critically betty smiled a little we're contemporaries jack you naturally can't see all the damaging evidences of my youth betty stood up i must get back to the library now she said i have some work to finish before opening it jack helped her on with her coat then betty went over to mrs brooks must you go betty asked mrs brooks holding her hand and drawing her down for a kiss i hoped you could go with us for a drive mother means in plain english a cruise in her automobile laughed jack i believe mother thinks it's not dignified to drive in anything but a victoria from the apologetic way she speaks of the car it does make so much noise and dust and smell mrs brooks answered seriously showing that her old-fashioned ideas of a lady's vehicle were not satisfied by an automobile i should love to go with you mrs brooks but as i tell the girls duty before don't don't oh spare us cried edith and gertrude simultaneously warding off betty's proverb with distended palms betty laughed and writing the proverb in the air to the two girls who had clapped their hands over their ears she fled out of the door end of chapter nineteen recording by holly jensen chapter twenty of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter twenty phosphorescence i had to get a breath of fresh air lois said betty pacing rapidly up and down the veranda and pressing her hand to her forehead tell me all that happened betty urged lois taking one cold little hand in hers let us go over there to the bridge somehow the sight of water rushing through the floodgate always calms me replied betty starting down the steps lois threw one arm caressingly over her shoulder and together the two friends walked thoughtfully to the old wooden bridge and leaned over the rail on which was deeply engraved the names of the lads of the neighborhood beneath them they could see the water from the pond flowing through the vents in the floodgate in its effort to catch the retreating tide with a steady pouring sound that was inexpressibly soothing the phosphorescence looks like stars tumbling down to the water said betty pointing to the illumination i never saw this so brilliant before said lois it is as you say like stars come very near such things ought to help us said betty meditatively look at the sky so perfectly clear and the stars laughing at us and oh there is the moon peeping over the hill it is actually coquetting with us when you are off alone this way doesn't everything seem like a friend or a relative 
i love that moon if it were running instead of sailing i'd feel that it was a playmate like edwina there is something young almost frivolous in a crescent moon said lois yet how positively hoary it is i fear we won't keep our good looks quite so long laughed betty turning her face up into the stream of silvery light and lois knew that the night had once more played its human role in calming and soothing her discouraged friend while they walked back and forth on the bridge betty told lois all the details of the day and in the end betty knew that now she could tell her mother without fear of breaking down she had herself well in hand when she and lois came into the hall where mrs baird sat by a table reading aloud to edwina from alice in wonderland i can't see after being out in the dark cried betty first shutting her eyes then shielding them from the light with her hand oh mother you should see the phosphorescence tonight. it's a miracle mrs baird looked up at the two girls bright pretty faces with keen satisfaction to see them so natural and unaffected so happy in little things that she knew from experience could give much contentment and in youth are often overlooked or passed by as uninteresting carissima you smile as if at two innocent chickens laughed betty who had learned to read her mother's face you know betty i am always happy when my two daughters are well we will let it go at that said betty teasingly though i suspect it is because we are so uncommonly beautiful wise and good you won't acknowledge it for fear of spoiling our sweet unconsciousness that speech doesn't show any great unconsciousness smiled her mother mrs siggins says that self-recommendation is no praise quoted edwina with grave inaccuracy betty gave a little shriek and lois dragged her down on the long sofa and buried her head on her shoulder laughing delightedly when betty in pantomime wrote down a siggins nugget edwina's dramatic instinct was satisfied with the commotion her remark had made and she went off to bed without a protest how unconscious are you anyway bet asked lois merely for something to say and to put off the telling of the news oh i am so unconscious that i am perfectly witless answered betty yawning ostentatiously then suddenly sitting upright she opened out her palms in a gesture of mock despair mother she said i am not to be the queen of the may any longer what does the child mean asked her mother in surprise and turning to lois with an inquiring glance laughing betty clapped her hand over lois's mouth i won't have my news spoiled by any plain sordid facts it simply means carissima that i am either behind the times or very far in advance of them now which is it when you are too shockingly young for a position they think you were too young for the library asked mrs baird quickly and from the look on her face lois saw that she had counted far more on the help it would be than they had expected but she gained control of her expression before betty who had been affecting to hunt something behind the pillows turned round yes carissima but don't worry no doubt it would have been the means of burying all the talents that i unconsciously believe i possess i looked upon it as the cloud with the silver lining rather pretty that silver lining library alliteration and all i am glad sweetheart that you have so much philosophy it might have become mere routine and crushed all your originality i am glad if you are to have you at home to wait until something with more of an outlook arises mrs baird went over to betty and sitting down by her took both hands in hers how cold they are she exclaimed anxiously looking into the dark eyes that always told betty's own self better than words especially when it came to sparing any one's feelings it must not hurt betty she added firmly that alone has the power to hurt us the ninety dollars you will have earned is splendid for a girl of your age and will more than pay your friend or his uncle goldstein i am glad too that you won't have to go out in all kinds of weather 
you know mother i am especially fond of what you call all kinds of weather rain snow and sleet said betty who felt that she could not accept any comfort then that was not of the highest brand such as self-sacrifice or a bright to-morrow how i hate that mr webby burst out lois i hate them all every trustee of them amplified betty i wish now that i had told mr cloud what i thought of him and the others that would have been beneath your dignity betty oh it's a positive agony sometimes not to be able to say to people all the things it would be beneath one's dignity to say declared betty vigorously every one laughed at betty's despairing face will you tell father she asked in milder tones your father has a good deal of sinful pride about his daughter's working and i believe he will be thankful that the silver lining has shown itself unless of course he sees that you are hurt you may be sure carissima i won't add to father's troubles i know i can trust your warm heart though you are impulsive impulsive in my case another word for spasmodic ugliness and equally spasmodic nobility said betty ruefully end of chapter twenty recording by holly jensen chapter twenty one of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter twenty one mary livingstone king's plan the brooks touring car was slowly mounting the long curving driveway that led up to mary king's home jack was driving the car and betty sat in front with him behind were mrs brooks lois edith gertrude and dunny oh exclaimed betty and lois simultaneously in the moonlight the wonderful picturesqueness of the great estate was revealed at every turn here and there through the stately pines oaks and elms gleamed pergolas of marble bay trees in immense carved hemispheres stood remote and classic in the shadows of the silent terraces the air was balmy from the distance came the pensive sound of falling water a footman liveried in green and gold opened the door while another servant deftly helped him to remove their wraps in an instant the butler approached for their cards and ushered them into the library mary appeared immediately and seized betty with her left hand while she extended to mrs brooks a more sedate right one this is perfectly delightful mrs brooks and betty and lois in my own home little did we dream of it at the pines it's bully said mr king welcoming mrs brooks then stepping aside to speak to betty how does our shanty please you he asked but of course you haven't seen much of it yet he added with his jovial laugh mary has been talking at a great rate about your artistic taste since she saw your place you know why this reminds me of the poems i have read of beautiful castles betty stopped for her eyes were taking in every charming feature of a modern house designed by a firm of architects of international reputation it was not as large as the pines she thought but in a certain delightful home feeling it came close to her ideal mrs king at once arranged a game of bridge and as betty did not play she sat down on a window seat one overlooking the cedars on the side of the hill below when the game was thoroughly started mary came to take betty through the house i want you to see everything first with me alone we always wanted to be alone when we read our ballads at the pines you have a ballad right here mary answered betty pointing down at the cedars hushed and waiting in the moonlight can't you see bird helen with her lily-white hand and golden hair riding her palfrey down there i can said mary falling into the spirit off there on the sound i see fair jeanette sailing the dangerous waters for her own true love what are you two mooning about asked jack who had sauntered up unnoticed jack what brings you here and here comes dunny go back both of you mary commanded you are to play cards while betty and i have a good long talk i say that's rough betty must play too betty's father doesn't like to have her play cards said mary 
i'll stay here then said jack flinging himself down next to mary oh jack do go away you are so blatantly modern go to your bridge with exaggerated limpness jack left them followed by dunny mary drew betty's hand in her arm and together they went into the drawing-room oh this is beautiful cried betty enthusiastically yes but there are some jarring notes and i want you to tell me what they are your house mary is very well intellectual looking you know how to reach one's tender spot said mary laughing you are right there mary called jack who had overheard her leaning forward to see better into the drawing-room here old man tend to your cards cried mr king jerking him back to the table mary and betty walked out of hearing there is something wrong with this room said mary looking around i have gone over all the things one by one and individually at least they are good but they are not restful do tell me what is wrong betty hesitated wouldn't it be rude to criticize mary's beautiful home i can tell by your face betty that you have laid your finger on the weak points please tell me what they are remember it will be a favor to tell me the sincere ring in mary's voice encouraged betty to speak you must not take me too seriously mary but i think you have entirely too many pictures they take from the grandeur of the views from these windows evidently the architects meant to have the decoration of the room subordinate to the magnificent picture outside mary looked from the windows to the picture-laden walls you are right betty exclaimed mary beginning at once to take down a small picture from between two of the windows your wall is beautiful enough to afford a few uncovered spaces still don't you think those beautiful brass sconces would look well there between the windows they are not pictures attempting to rival the beauties outside then mary betty grew embarrassed do tell me everything mary urged you have opened my eyes and i shall have this room changed to-morrow well then you have very little contrast your things are all figured your rugs your furniture coverings your portieres your walls that's the trouble i am so relieved thank you betty thank you oh you are actually crimson in your hatred of saying anything uncomplimentary your house is simply splendid and it seemed impertinent to say it answered betty sighing with relief that the disagreeable ordeal was over you are not through yet laughed mary there is the library betty hung back let me enjoy these lovely things mary no i must have your opinion on the library some other day pleaded betty but the one laughing the other expostulating they went into the library now this is perfect cried betty no it isn't you can't escape that way it is depressing all you need is a decided touch of yellow and a piece of tapestry and a vase of chrysanthemums good i am sure you have hit it now you must see the remainder of the house and tell me what you think about the other rooms when they came downstairs and resumed their seats in the window betty's eyes were glowing with the joy of having seen so many delightful rooms and the intellectual satisfaction of analyzing them with a friend who was in perfect sympathy betty mary stopped clasped betty's hands and looked down as if she found it hard to go on her mind was now on something besides the house brace up mary laughed betty giving her a little shake well said mary hesitatingly mrs brooks told me about the library mean lady i wanted to tell you that myself it has become one of my pet stories jack is keeping count of the number of times i tell it he says he is now at ten i must tell you the way the impeccable mr webby was shocked at my innocent youth and the way his followers led by mr cloud my cloud with the silver lining crawled into the library the next morning i was wild to tell you but you were out of town it was too funny afterwards betty sighed remembering how little she had found it mirthful at the time mary still held her hand in a warm loving grasp good for you bet you always were full of pluck tell me the details betty made a good story out of her adventure trying hard to forget her pain and disappointment but she succeeded only partially in concealing them from mary's affectionate looks 
when she had finished mary sat silent pondering while betty quivering with the memories of the past few days tried to banish them by examining the pictures mary looked up her eyes full of a problem and almost mechanically her glance followed betty's from object to object then came back to betty's face and noted there her interest in the arrangement of a certain corner they had discussed suddenly a light dawned in her eyes it's the very thing she said aloud the very thing mary repeated you are the very one for it and it will suit you to perfection i know it will i am sure it will i am the very one for it repeated betty gaily what is it that will suit me with such exquisite perfection i hope you are not forgetting that i have been a misfit for some time have you another librarian's position for me librarian of some very very young girls younger even than my dreadful youth if that is possible no indeed betty baird said mary emphatically no more librarians positions for you but a place where your original genius will have a chance unhampered even by your dreadful youth as you call it we have a friend an old friend of the family's who has taken up household decoration as a profession she has a large fortune but at forty she found herself tired of frivolity and she determined to have an interest in life as her brothers had and now she has a clientele that any one might be proud of she is extremely attractive indeed she is wonderful now betty here is my plan she has beautiful rooms on fifth avenue and she told me recently that she wished she had a sister or someone who was congenial and would see things from the same point of view she feels all these ideas keenly and she is temperamentally unfit to enjoy them alone she wants an associate to share her joy in her work she has those about her who only want to earn money and who have no enthusiasm betty you are the very one to be with miss minturne mary betty's brilliant eyes showed the fascination the subject held for her while mary talked she could not say another word you are made for it said mary emphatically and it will be just the thing for you until you marry and are happy like myself she continued looking over at her husband yes betty you must marry but not for years betty laughed i can't tell you how funny that sounds from you alexander says i am going to be a regular matchmaker you that is very oldish laughed betty i am oldish and what's more i like being oldish mary asserted and i like it in you but then i like everything about you one can never outgrow one's first ideal i never could see why you put me on such a pedestal that makes one oldish there you won't forgive me i see cried betty you sarcastic girl or old married woman mary laughed and pulled betty who was now standing down on the seat beside her you are a nice one betty saying all sorts of things and calmly ignoring my wrath the girls laughed over the nonsense in sheer light-heartedness why aren't you more enthusiastic about my plan demanded mary suddenly aware that betty was surprisingly cool about it enthusiastic mary listen to the sad story of my life i was enthusiastic over pickles beautiful pickles too fifty bottles of them where oh where are yesterday's pickles then i bubbled over on preserves twenty-five jars also betty's best brand where are my preserves my garden was my next enthusiasm where are now my purple melons and late winter tomatoes then came l i t e r a t u r e where is my literature softly in the waste paper basket alone of all my enthusiasms i know where literature lieth yet is not my sad tale ended where is the best librarian in america by your side libraryless dost weep with an extravagant gesture of despair betty sank down at mary's side oh betty the same betty baird mary cried drawing her towards her and throwing her arms around her you make everything so humorous i know it's only your pluck edith told me too about those disgusting webbies we are going to cut them they deserve it for their contemptible actions his cousin has plenty of money and doesn't need what are you two gossiping about called over jack interrupting her 
your very dear friend betty's impeccable webby replied mary jack made a significant gesture as of punching a head mr king nodded approvingly and said i can get even with old webby and everybody applauded you see what good friends you have said mary yes and it makes everything easier betty replied gratefully you will consider my plan won't you mary asked consider it why mary i am wild about it i won't be able to think of another thing until i hear from you good cried mary as betty sprang up and walking up and down the two went into details occasionally stopping to look over the shoulders of the card players isn't mrs brooks lovely said betty glancing over at the table her eyes resting admiringly on the stately graying head she has such an elegantly detached air yet she is playing conscientiously so that she won't spoil the game that dunny is a character i have known him for years said mary he doesn't seem very intellectual but that shrewd upper lip means something is he sarcastic not a bit he is only a wholesome boy without the gift of expression boys are necessarily limited he and jack are loyal friends jack has one of his professors told me this summer fine natural gifts but he will not apply himself he is home every saturday and sunday and thinks more of his car than of his college i think you were spurring him he says there never was a girl like you i like him who could help it for he is winning in that frank way without any kind of pretense but i do think it is a terrible pity that he has no ambition is it because he has so much money the game is up interrupted the subject of their discussion coming up with lois look here dunny you toddle off he commanded as his friend diffidently approached with his hands in his pockets the game is over dunny defended himself what of it there are two girls there you leave them to a married man the husband of this amiable lady here and come poaching on my preserves they all turned and looked at the other party three ladies there three here you see where your place is jack summed up and without ceremony he wheeled dunny around facing the table and commanded forward march dunny smiled good-naturedly but turned and walked over to lois alec is happy he's on his hobby horse showing off those old english prints of his he said that edith is a peach why don't you go over and snuggle up to her insisted jack satisfied where i am dunny announced he and lois quickly found a topic of conversation for lois had the sweetest courtesy and was so much interested in others that she instinctively found the subject most congenial and most likely to put shy people at their ease jack looked his amazement as he heard the continuous sound of dunny's deep voice listen to him prattling i didn't know it was in him he said to betty i must go now and speak to my other guests said mary betty you have a way of making one forget there are other charming people around betty explained mary's plan for her to jack miss minturn you would be in luck she is the most fascinating woman in new york mother will be mightily pleased for they are old friends they went to madame bon temps school together then finished off together in france all were surprised when mrs brooks intimated that it was time for them to leave i shall write to miss minturn to-morrow betty whispered mary kissing her good-night do and oh how i thank you and thank you mary for thinking of me i do think it is perfectly splendid of you i'll talk it over with mother and i know she will be delighted as they sped through the grounds betty turned around in her seat we have had a perfect evening mrs brooks and thank you for it she said they are delightful people answered mrs brooks mr king is one of the few men who when helping me on with my coat do not make me feel old mrs brooks you old came in a chorus of flattering reproach from the four girls at least you must let me say that i am not so young as i once was she answered pleased with her evident sincerity mr king talks a great deal about his own affairs complained gertrude i think it is greedy to take up all the conversation talking about yourself he's interested in his collection of old prints said dunny 
he perfectly lectured about them said gertrude who for some reason felt aggrieved and dissatisfied i felt like beginning a story just to keep him quiet when i go to places where the people are great talkers i often start in that way though i always let them talk a while before i leave because it's disagreeable to hear one's own voice ringing in one's ears and to know they are saying what a great talker you are betty and lois nudged each other they had grown to love edith but gertrude's selfishness and worldly attitude kept them from anything more than a distant acquaintance they wondered how edith genuine and unselfish and clever could remain her warm friend and they could only explain it by the fact that they had grown up together now gertrude i think you are expressing a pessimistic view that you don't feel said edith gertrude is full of a bitter philosophy that she never acts upon thank goodness she added anyway it was a jolly evening declared jack and everyone echoed his sentiment End of chapter 21. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 22 of Betty Baird's Ventures by Anna Hamlin Weichel. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 22. In the Study dr baird stooped over his study table on which lay a letter from miss minturne noting with his forefinger an important point then after studying it for a moment passing on his eyes travelling slowly over the many pages betty curled up in his big armchair watched him closely she knew it would take him some time to grasp the business details for his scholarly abstraction made it somewhat difficult for him to grasp a business proposition at a glance she looked at him wistfully at his fast graying hair his careworn face and his bent shoulders and her heart gave a great throb of pitying understanding of what life had meant to the gentle reserved scholar whose early and middle years had been spent far from his peers yet he had loved research for its own sake not for any renown that might come to him she understood too that his heart was filled with the tenderest love for humanity and an enthusiasm which though quiet and patient was ever abiding and which found its own reward in contributing to that humanity's well-being and happiness still betty could see the reverse side of the shield he loved congenial discussion of his classical writers and delighted in pleasantries and social relaxation with those who were interested in his special lines of study but as long as she could remember he had lived in a narrow valley that somehow seemed to contract the spirit of those who dwelt within its limits and where there had been no one with whom to exchange an idea except about crops or politics or church news now she at seventeen had been chafing under a slight disappointment but down in her heart betty realized that something deeper and sweeter than a mere youthful longing to try her wings was pushing her out she could see that more lines had come into her father's face since they moved to long island that the city's strife and bustle were new to the retired scholar and that night found him weary and often depressed with the weight of burdens that had been laid upon him and here was this struggle to secure a home for himself and family before old age or sickness superannuated him this it was betty knew that made her disappointments and failures hard to bear i will help i will she said to herself i am young and strong and i have i know i have a gift that is worth something she mused a moment with her chin lying in the pink palm of her hand her eyes unseeingly following the pattern of the rug until recalled by her father's voice daughter i can support my only child certainly he said looking up from the letter and throwing back his shoulders with a pathetic pride that set betty's heart trembling with love and pain he looked very thin and worn in the bright autumn light and his clerical coat shone where it had been often brushed and pressed she jumped up and going back of his chair began to smooth his hair then throwing her arms around his neck she buried her bright head on his shoulder the clergyman's lined face shone and he drew her down on his knee and putting his hand on either cheek kissed the pretty quivering mouth without a word they understood each other 
now father betty said briskly sliding down from his knee and sitting on a stool at his feet we must be very very businesslike they both laughed as if at the best joke in the world when hearts are full it takes little to bring either tears or laughter and it is the toss of a feather which it will be for their sources lie very close together yes i believe in looking things in the face answered dr baird firmly though no one shrank more consistently than he from seeing anything but the desirable where his family was involved although far from carelessly optimistic he had a true scholar's disinclination to face any problem that disturbed his pursuits perhaps i should have stayed in weston he said in a low voice evidently going over an old problem his head bent and slowly fitting the tips of his fingers together but i felt it to be a call to come here home missions have always been close to my heart sometimes i am afraid i am not fitted for work in this great city that i was too old to take it up i have lived in my study no one is fitter than you father cried betty hotly you are in the prime of life and you are young and handsome too we must not discuss me elizabeth he said smiling and patting her cheeks that had flamed in indignant denial your problem is under consideration now do you think you would be happy in new york it is such a big place for my little daughter i did not like the idea of your taking the library but that was at home and your mother did not object do you want to undertake this enterprise with miss minturn father i long long just long to there cried betty laughing and standing up in front of him and clasping her hands as she uttered the there with an emphatic ring in her sweet voice that's enough said dr baird laughing too when she tumbled down in a heap at his feet i don't quite understand her proposition he began adjusting his glasses and looking over miss minturn's letter oh must we understand it she is a lady and everything will be fair it will be fair of course i should not question a lady's business honor however we may not be able to live up to her expectations did your mother understand her letter mother said it was not clear that she wrote mostly about irrelevant things and that we would have to make arrangements when we saw her but she liked the tone of the letter your mother has keen insight do we have to talk any more about the business side father can't we wait asked betty finance is dry yes and unprofitable too she added laughing for we are always exactly where we were before we began to discuss it if talking about it would make one cent appear in our pocket where there was none before it would be different but it doesn't make us a bit richer dr baird listened with an amused smile elizabeth you think i do not understand i do you were what i was at your age and for many years afterward i could not patiently endure any keeping of accounts any discussion of ways and means any money calculations indeed i am not sure even now that i know my multiplication table betty was intensely interested her father had always appeared to her to be the quintessence of methodical ways and she had believed that it was a natural gift at college he continued i frequently went without meals because i had not calculated had not determined how to spend my money if i saw a book i wanted i bought it and every month before my allowance from home was due my pocket was empty he laughed softly over the recollection of those college days and the improvidence that had many and many a time led him to the bookstall instead of to the refectory was not the least pleasant in a throng of memories you are just as well off now father and i do believe you enjoy the memory of those books more than you would have the good meals you might have had in their place then urged betty with a shrewd little smile following in imagination the line her father's thoughts had taken yes i do he admitted i was always at the mercy of a bookseller he sighed then smiled and took down one of the many volumes of a handsome edition of livy he shook his head almost reproachfully over it he cost me many a meal he said and very lovingly he turned the leaves and patted the worn morocco binding 
betty leaned over his shoulder with a new and almost devout interest in the fragrant book now how can you father in all conscience preach to me when you see the good results of your own wicked ways she said gaily smoothing the hair that was growing a little thin around the temples and she felt that she had won sit down elizabeth we must come to an understanding about this proposition i thought you and mother had decided that i could do exactly what i wanted to betty answered she was still standing for she was afraid the question would find its way back to the commercial details her young enthusiasm could not brook too long a delay at the commonplace threshold of a new and wonderful experience where all her dreams were to be realized you can easily understand elizabeth her father went on disregarding her remark that i am more conscientious about affairs because of this early indifference to them now your mother is naturally practical and she does not need to hold herself so rigidly to what i believe is the best way to conduct the purely business side of life we grow very strong on any natural weakness as we grow older that is we people with consciences do if i go with miss minturn i'll make money betty's eyes looked very large over the idea i can support you daughter her father answered again with a dignity that somehow held a touch of sadness but i cannot give you what are called advantages the sadness predominated over even the wounded pride what advantages father travel principally betty's eyes shone oh father i'd love to see rome and florence and venice her father regarded her steadily while into his eyes crept a new look the look of one who has his carcass on yet patient as my life has been one dearest sight i have not seen it almost seems a wrong a dream i had when life was new alas are dreams they come not true i thought to see fair carcass on i have not seen fair carcass on you may take the position child dr baird said gently why father what made you yield so suddenly what has weakened your pride for mother said it was pride betty laughed as she leaned against her father and gave him a joyous hug yes it was pride though masquerading under a somewhat different guise i do not like the idea that i can't do everything for my only child but i know that if i should die there would be almost nothing for you fortunately this new position will allow you to be at home every night we can go and come on the same trains and have our luncheon together in a quiet place i shall stay at the library until the end of the month for i want that ninety dollars it sounds awfully important doesn't it you will be able to travel now betty i always wanted to see the land of virgil then later it was palestine yes most of all it was palestine oh father we can go both of us i have been reading so many articles this summer on how to see europe on two hundred and fifty dollars i shall have that much soon and your mother betty's face shadowed then brightened nothing would make mother happier than to know that we are happy she hates to travel and we could not make her go aunt rachel could stay with her for three months they would both love it no child the time has passed for me there is a time for everything i learn that lesson better every year my time for travelling has passed i am no longer eager i think you ought to go for my sake betty said using her best argument miss green will take you but he added how like us to be counting our chickens before they are hatched i have not done it on this scale for twenty years nevertheless said betty with an emphatic shake of her head these chickens are going to be hatched i feel it in my bones as katie says and you are going to palestine with me daddy mine i know you are end of chapter twenty two recording by holly jensen chapter twenty three of betty baird's ventures by anna hamlin weichel this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen chapter twenty three betty meets miss minturn 
oh i'm nearly crazy where is my hat pin the one with the dull black head and my best handkerchief oh lois i will be late if you have set your mind on being late how can i think of grammar at a time like this said betty petulantly anyway will is as good as shall i will drown nobody shall help me quoted lois sarcastically for as a result of the excitement the two friends had been having a little sword-play lois you are as mean as you can be you might help me cried betty crossly dashing around pulling open drawers and slamming doors you will have to get a maid betty if you don't keep your things together better what has come over you at school you are systematic enough criticisms are rather unnecessary at a time like this betty answered loftily turning over the upper drawer of her chiffonier in an effort to find her best handkerchief lois stalked out of the room and sat down on the extreme edge of her bed she was indignant at betty and miserable herself in consequence and the very edge of the bed seemed to fit her feelings the friends had occasional tiffs but in the end their friendship always came out whole and not even the seams of its mending showed though mrs baird warned them that when they grew older these quarrels would be more serious and they would not have the wholesome young spirits that recover quickly they loved each other however with a love founded on respect for each other's best qualities and while opposite temperamentally they did not often clash to a greater extent than to display a few sparks of irony betty ransacked the closet for her fur scarf a charming bit of ermine that her father had given her in weston before the house buying burden made such a gift an impossibility oh lois where is my fur betty cried impatiently wholly unaware that her friend was sitting disconsolately on the edge of the bed where you threw it last night i have no doubt answered lois in a dignified voice betty tossed her head her lack of time and the wonderful event that was pressing made her less keen to retort the fur must be found at once or she would miss the train she could not imagine herself going to see miss minturn without that lovely fur lois heard betty open and shut drawers and closet doors and her angry little temper softened she half arose i have it no thanks to you called betty and without turning her head towards lois's room she ran downstairs lois sat still on the edge of the bed betty was going to new york for the day and oh dear how awful if there should be a wreck and betty hurt dear betty who always grew impatient when she had to hurry too much and couldn't find things lois knew just the things that betty's otherwise equable temper could not stand and one was the loss of a hat pin she started up intending to run downstairs when she heard a great scurry of skirts and betty rushed in and hugged her forgive me lois oh my hat i was a bear a cross patch i must skedaddle i couldn't leave mad a car might kill me something might happen to you while i'm away good-bye come to the station for us i'll have lots to tell good-bye and down the steps she bounded betty was going to the city to see miss minturn who had according to her circular a studio school of decoration and applied art betty was to learn the art of decorating and in the meantime her car fare and other expenses would be met by the salary she was to receive as miss minturn's assistant of course the success of the whole plan depended on whether miss minturn would like betty for the position meant great intimacy and miss minturn was extremely fastidious in choosing her friends it depended too on whether betty would prove to have the requisite gifts it was a delightful day and walking down fifth avenue with her father betty felt the tonic of the ocean breeze that swept through the long avenues but the contact with the people the surging sea of faces thrilled her as nothing had ever done not even that wonderful night when she stood before an audience and felt the enthusiasm carried to her from hundreds of upturned faces and heard soft music and knew it was her commencement not even then was there such a leaping of the heart such a tingling to the fingertips of mysterious excitement 
oh the people the wonderful people going endlessly doing great and marvellous things hurrying by with that look of deep concentration with that rapid stride that distinguished air as of big things planned and executed the very hands of the men were different from those of the weston and the long island men the clenched fists all handsomely gloved gripped the heads of walking sticks perhaps under it there was a dim symbolism of the way things were carried on in the city the lion's claws beneath the glossy lamb's skin with eager expectant eyes betty watched the hurrying passers-by each person was a story a romance a tragedy or a comedy the toddling children with their nurses were ballads and her heart responded to a troop of merry schoolgirls who wheeled by under the careful surveillance of a prim teacher but it did not go out to them as it did to those who seemed a part of the world of action betty going to find her life's work saw everything in a new light she was no longer a mere onlooker the stores the carriages the newsboys the cars the shoppers all that contributed to the swing and tumult of the day made her draw full breaths of exultation for what she could not have told only to be alive oh how good it was how good to be alive and form an integral part of the busy world her father with his head slightly bent saw nothing of the bustling city his mind was dwelling on the day's work and more than all else on the future of the lovely young daughter who almost danced by his side with the joy of being in the current of action his daughter was his delight his pride his dreams were all for her what would this day mean to her his lips trembled betty saw only the magnificent power of the city her father felt some of its crushing strength oh father isn't it too grand to be true called out betty above the roar of the trolley and seizing his coat as they pushed through the crowd a white-haired lady stepping from her victoria turned on hearing the sweet young voice and smiled when she saw the bright countenance many turned even at that busy hour to look again at the happy fresh face the beautiful eyes that seemed to love the strange sights and people the glamour of unfamiliarity concealed every unpleasant sight and sound betty's own young heart and high purposes were the measure of her impressions there was at least one perfectly happy face and carefree heart on fifth avenue that sparkling winter day miss minturn's studio was in one of those charming old-fashioned houses on lower fifth avenue that have yielded their reserve and pride to the demands of the business world yet reluctantly and in their reluctance still possessing something of their former grace and urbanity the immaculately white and shining marble floor and stairway the air of retirement of exclusiveness after the glare and noise of the city impressed betty it was to be another delightful world at a white door they found the name father look at that magnificent brass knocker exclaimed betty while they waited a moment to gain their breath and to adjust themselves to the contrast in light and atmosphere is my hat straight father whispered betty facing him her father looked at it conscientiously and nodded affirmatively a boy in buttons took their cards and ushered them into a small reception room the room was white and green some odd pieces of brass and copper a beautiful painted seat that betty was to learn came from brittany a rug or two and a quaint bit of tapestry gave all the colors the room needed without disturbing its repose a long horizontal window of leaded glass with a seat underneath added to the old world air the room presented a door opened and a tall woman entered betty's first thought was of her height her next that everything would be exactly as she dreamed it would be for with a woman like this fulfilment of dreams was a necessity miss minturn held out her hand to dr baird who had risen when she stepped in betty told lois afterwards that she knew it would be slim and cool she gazed without restraint while miss minturn talked with her father for after a frankly open look of examination she left betty to herself miss minturn's face was pale and her hair beginning to turn gray was parted in the middle and though carefully arranged was so heavy that it fell into odd curves about her forehead and neck it was like sculptured hair 
every feature was modelled yet there was no monotony in her appearance for her rich personality asserted itself immediately betty felt that all the throbbing colorful thrilling city life was concentrated in this strangely lovely woman yes jack brooks was entirely right miss minturne was fascinating i should like to show you the other rooms miss minturne said with an inquiring glance and standing up the adjoining room was large and even more charming this is the living room where we shall have our tea she said smiling at betty and taking her hand for a moment and where we shall hope to see your father often all negotiations were begun and ended with those words and that quick warm pressure of the hand and this was miss minturne's way of saying she found betty all her mind and heart and taste desired as she told an old friend that evening yet she prided herself on her business methods even dr baird the least business-like of men had an uneasy feeling that some formality was lacking a word to the effect that betty should come there or something he was not clear what but not a word was said and to the doctor it would have seemed indelicate to introduce the subject to a lady betty stayed throughout the day miss minturne insisted on taking her to luncheon at her own home on washington square when her father called for her and the door had closed on the smiling face of her new friend betty sighed with the exhaustion of one who has had many months crowded into a day she was eager to tell her mother and lois every detail mother cried betty throwing herself into her mother's arms it is better than you ever could imagine i am happy happy we will soon have our house paid for she threw off her hat picked up edwina who was clinging to her dress and danced madly about with her at last she sank down on the sofa before the blazing fire and edwina cuddled close to her for she had missed her cousin this first day of separation lois dropped gaily on the other side and dr and mrs baird completed the semicircle what is miss minturne like bet mary actually raved over her was lois's first question no wonder she raved she is like a heroine of a great novel she's taller than i am and not unlike a rossetti everyone laughed it was good to hear betty again and lois out of pure joy at having her home began accusing her of exaggeration she is a remarkable-looking woman said the doctor seriously and then it was betty's turn to jeer good-naturedly at lois she has a perfect nose said betty and with that tightness of the skin across the bridge that gives people a look of distinguished though wearied refinement if that isn't like betty laughed lois who ever heard of a nose of wearied refinement i didn't say that did i noses are distinguished and that sort of pulled look does give people a refined look maybe it's because they're sick or thin anyway it's high bred betty insisted she always had new valuations for personal characteristics you say too that large veins in an old lady's hand are distinguished mocked lois merrily those of a certain kind are those are the hands that have splendid family rings on how old is miss minturne asked mrs baird smiling indulgently at the happy wrangle i can never tell ages mother i noticed that she went down some dark stairs sidewise and held her dress up in front while it trailed in the back young people never do those things no matter what she does she is glorious i just adore the cool high-bred indifferent air women like miss minturne have your description is graphic betty but hardly definite said mrs baird laughing betty laughed too and leaned back comfortably with her hands clasped behind her head oh betty begin at the beginning and go right through the day pleaded lois i have so much to tell that i can't tell a thing lois wailed betty there is her house on washington square it's my ideal you said the same thing about mary king's laughed lois laying her head on betty's shoulder and betty retaliated by jerking her shoulder away girls girls do be quiet i am anxious to hear the news there isn't any news carissima it's all impressionistic miss minturne gives you impressions all the time the impressions are fine and who wants details 
what was more ideal about her house than mary's asked lois now sitting at some distance it wasn't more ideal but different miss minturne's has a historic storied look storied ah murmured lois betty ignored her oh mother we had the best dessert for luncheon i must find out how it was made my mother's cookery journal would be crazy over it mrs baird saw that it was hopeless so far as her daughter was concerned and turned to her husband with a question the doctor gave what explicit details he could but he too found that the interview with miss minturne had been impressionistic the door knocker sounded and edwina who always hurried to open the door threw it wide to mary and her husband just a moment we are on our way home from new york but i could not go by without seeing you and hearing how you liked miss minturne said mary in a breathless way standing and refusing all inducements to sit down though she warmed her hands at the fire oh mrs baird she went on i must congratulate you miss minturne fell in love with betty it is a great compliment for she is very exacting but if she once cares for anyone it's for life and she is the most wonderful woman in the city she says don't let bet hear this that she is her ideal of a young girl what could be nicer no thank you i won't sit down i must go mr king was shaking with laughter at mary's volubility for no one had had a word since she came in and with hurried good-byes they were again in their car end of chapter twenty three recording by holly jensen